Allied Bomber Command is now dealing heavier blows on Germany than last year's record assault. In a daylight raid, Lancasters dropped countless incendiaries and 4,000 pounders on Duisburg, port of the Ruhr. Here is a night attack on Brunswick. In little over half an hour, the Allied planes dropped 800 tons of bombs direct on their target. Fires below reveal their accuracy. Holland, the British Second Army resumes its offensive after a comparative lull in order to bring up supplies for the assault. Trapping the Germans near the mouth of the Scheldt, the British and Canadians slog ahead on three fronts. These operations are strategically designed to liberate the port of Antwerp for Allied supplies. Here time runs out for these German troops. This miracle of modern warfare is the man-made portable harbor off Aromanche in Normandy. Stretching two miles in width and a full mile out to sea, the artificial harbor is rewriting military history. Prime Minister Churchill suggested the idea. The ingenuity of Britain and America developed it into the invasion harbor. This is the great secret of invasion success. hundred miles across the channel, concrete caissons are towed. Then they are sunk off the beach as a breakwater. For nine months before D-Day, this harbor in bits and pieces was being manufactured secretly by the Allies. Just five days after D-Day, a fleet of 60 block ships are sunk here to form an outer breakwater of three miles. And 12 days after D-Day, the Allies have half the harbor completed and one flexible pier in use here. The worst northeasterly gale in 40 years smashes at this harbor, but it withstands the fury of the sea. A second harbor built for American forces in a more exposed area crumples up. The capture of Cherbourg, port of France, solved the supply problem for the Allies. Smashing seas during the gale carry pier equipment to the bottom, but the work continues. Without this harbor, the entire invasion effort was facing peril. Supply ships and landing craft were carrying men and guns to battle in Normandy. Now the worst of the storm is over, and at the end of each pier go the thousand-ton steel pontoons equipped with cranes. 
Liberty ships and large tank landing craft unload at the artificial harbor. Men and tons of supplies for the Allied Armies of Liberation pass through this harbor. The port, made of bits and pieces, is one of man's greatest engineering marvels. Harbor, helping to bring defeat to the enemy, is a tribute to Allied ingenuity and cooperation. Total war, patterned by the Nazis for all Europe, comes at last to Germany. This is the frontier town of Aachen the first to fall under the full weight of Allied military might. Because the Nazi commander Wilk refused to surrender, the city was bombed and shelled for 12 days before the American First Army took the town. Forced to remain by SS troops, German civilians give themselves up to the Allies, seeking safety in the American lines. They took the brunt of the attack in concrete shelters. Long-range guns pound the back areas east of the town. Moving in, General Hodges' infantry troops fight in the streets for a week in a grim house-to-house -house battle. White flags appear outside a few buildings, but the battle is fierce for every yard. Here are the people of the city which once bore the French name of Aix-la-Chapelle. These are ordinary Germans whose sons and husbands carried war across the face of Europe to bring disaster back to their own doorstep. Tanks bulldoze their way through buildings where Nazi roadblocks bar the streets. The bitter last-ditch battle of crack SS troops forces the Allies to pound Dachin. The Nazis proclaim a new People's Army of the Volkssturm to bolster home morale. But hope is fading in many German cities under the impact of Allied military forces. After the battle, the German civilians leave their shelters. Seven-foot walls and Nazi guns no longer protect them from the war wheeling back on Germany. Surrender forms the only choice now for these Germans. Aachen points the way. Mm -hmm. 